it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, Rwanda rebound. The House of Lords has inflicted fresh defeats on the government over its flagship Rwanda bill. I wonder if we should stop calling it that. And a criminal investigation is underway and staff are being interviewed at a private clinic tonight over whether the Princess of Wales' medical records were unlawfully accessed in an alleged data breach. Plus, a landmark law banning future generations from smoking takes its first legislative steps. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. It's all happening on the show tonight. We're back in Westminster for the latest hokey-cokey on the Rwanda bill. I'll be telling you why I think the Church of England has given up on Christianity, and we've got the latest evidence that there really is a Loch Ness monster. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Don't you dare go anywhere. Now, in a fresh blow to the Tory party, the House of Lords has inflicted new defeats on the government over its flagship Rwanda bill. Seven proposed changes, including a provision to ensure due regard for domestic and international law, were passed by the peers. MPs will now have to vote on the bill again, delaying the passage of it until after Easter. Down in Westminster, the Sun's deputy political officer, Ryan Savey, uh, is hanging around trying to find out what on earth is going on with this... Uh, I suppose we can stop calling it flagship Rwanda bill, uh, for the moment at least, Ryan. Um, once again, those who said that this would all be done and dusted this week might be uh, said to have been wrong again. Yeah, there's absolutely no chance of this legislation um, getting royal assent by the end of the week. Um, interestingly, the government, it seems, haven't tabled or, or, or given it any time um, until before Easter. So this will drag itself on until um, middle of April when the legislation will eventually get passed. But when uh, MPs do consider it again, there'll be those seven amendments that will be attached to it. And we're into that, we, we, in that phrase, we keep calling it the, the ping pong between the two houses. That's exactly where we are. And it'll be the MPs who will sp then send it back to uh, the House of Lords Lords um, to um, to actually get the Lords to, to think again on mm. this. And the, the, sort of the bare bones of what has been voted in by the Lords tonight is something that will presumably please the lawyers and upset the rights of the Tory party. Yeah, that's right. So the, the legislation or the amendments that they've put onto it is to um, adhere to international and, and, and domestic law. But what the Tory ministers have been calling these these wrecking amendments. They'd be they'd be wrecking the bill. So eventually, uh, the Lords will back down. Now the majorities on those votes have reduced a little bit, but um, but not enough. So they'll go back to the two MPs, who then who will then strip them bare again, and it will go back to the Lords. And what we can probably expect to happen is, as we saw, there were ten amendments first of all, then there were seven that were voted on. You just wonder whether the the Lords will bring it down to two or three next. Next time, but eventually they will give in. They will not stand in the way or throw obstacles um, in the way um, of this legislation. It will get passed, but that is just being put back until probably mid-April, uh, last week of April. Yeah. So into the summer term, effectively, really, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Um, but I think it plays into... Um, I don't think you'll get too many people in Conservative circles say this too loudly, but I think it may play into the Conservative hands slightly because by delaying it, it's just going to be a few days or so before those May elections. And um, I think if you can say that you've got the royal assent to, the, to your, as we just mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the flagship legislation, it's going to play into your hands slightly. And um, it shows that you're actually getting on with something. You've, uh, Rishi Sunak will say he's had the 
tenacity to make sure that he stuck along with this, uh, this legislation and actually finally got it passed. And you can look to seeing those flights, those flights eventually get off the ground in about uh, probably, it looks like it will probably be uh, mid-June now if there are no legal challenges on an individual basis. Just in time for the school holidays. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Ryan Saby down there in Westminster uh, trying to report on the never-ending saga, which is now, uh, of course, the Rwanda Safety Bill. With me now in the studio, Candice Holdsworth, uh, the journalist, Telegraph's Annabelle Denham and Barrister and Broadcaster Andrew Eborn. Welcome to all of you. Um, I don't know how much longer I can put up with any more conversations about Rwanda. What I can say is there was also a 1922 committee meeting tonight, at which we are reliably informed by sources in the Tory party. Uh, Rishi Sunak got a great big standing ovation and lots of people... <laughs> banging desks and it was all wonderful but what I could also tell you was there was a guy stabbed on a dinghy coming across the channel today hundreds of people arrived in Dover uh, and also there's a moment on video which we might be able to see later of a boat actually um, full of many many migrants about 60 migrants um, basically being moved out of French waters um, by the people driving it away from French coast guard ships towards the RNLI so nothing is ever going to change in this situation is it? No, and I just, you know, what Rishi Sunak is trying to do is he's trying to create the biggest disincentive possible to break the model of the human traffickers. Yeah. Do you make it impossible for people... They, they have to know, if I pay my money, if I give my money to this trafficker, I am not going to get entry into the UK. Right. You know, and it's a waste of time. And That's one way of doing it. You manage people's incentives. I mean, Keir Starmer wants to do it another way. He wants to tackle the traffickers directly. But how practical is that? Right. And I just wonder what position it would leave, it, leave him in if, in the most optimist, optimistic scenario imaginable, flights do start taking off from June. People are quite happy with it. Would he then reverse that policy? Well, I have no idea what Keir Starmer will do because Keir Starmer won't tell us, Annabelle, yeah. will he? I'm not sure Keir Starmer knows what Keir Starmer mm. will do. He'll probably no. stick his finger in the air, see what the public mood is like, and yes. then later decide. Look, I think that this everybody's getting tired of the Miranda Bill. Now we're going to have this ping-pong between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. I think that this was inevitable. Like Ryan says, in some way this does play into the government's hand. The yeah. timing of the bill getting over the line could be good uh, as the Tories go into May elections that they are expecting to be very breezing indeed. I think it's also an opportunity for Rishi to present himself as, or present it as being the Tories versus Labour. Yeah. Labour are the ones who are trying to thwart this. Labour are the ones who haven't come up with a coherent plan yeah. for how they're going to stop the boats. So there really would be some symbolism if we were to see some planes getting off the ground. And we saw a bit of that in later in yeah. the spring. I mean, I'm not sure anybody cares anymore at this point, though. You know, even if they get 50, 50 people onto a plane or yes. 100 people, or even mm. 200 people onto a plane. They know that at the other end, there's only room for about 500 people anyway. I, but I saw Keir Starmer um, was, was, was being attacked for that by, by Sunak today in Prime Minister's Questions, where he accused him of being the guy that likes to stop dangerous criminals from being deported from this country because, of course, he famously signed that letter, didn't he, yes. uh, for the rapist and the murderer who then came back in and murdered some more people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it is the, the t typical political ping-pong with more pong than ping. Yeah. Uh, and this a is what's going to happen. There's a lot of pong. And I think that that's the reality of this. And and as you say, what happens is at least there's a plan. Piers Morgan will lose his £1,000 bet. There will be at least one plane that takes off. Uh, however, you keep saying that, but I'm not sure you're right about that. Well, you know, we, Piers Morgan we, wins most of his bets. Uh, well, with this one because it's going to happen and I do think it's going to inevitable probably around June time that they're going to get it through and it'll be a win it'll be a tick for Rishi on that sort of basis um, but absolutely as Candice said the reality is what they're trying to do is stop the traffickers in the first place it's not to send people to Rwanda it's to make it so unattractive that mm. they don't come in the first place mm. and if we look at that and, say, um, and that's not ever going to be the case the way things are going because yeah. we're spending more and more money housing them we just had the uh, the auditors saying that actually housing them in hotels is probably the cheapest option yes and you're kind of going oh great so, so we can't put them in uh, in sort of formerly uh, barracks or, or old army camps because that's going to cost even more. That's just so typical, and it, is, it seems like a slightly boring subject. But procurement is such an issue for government. Yeah. I mean, we saw it during the pandemic as well. Mm. You know, they want to move quickly, so they just you know grab people on board, and they don't think about costs right. and they underestimate how much they'll need. And it's such a typical story, and it's. One thing that I think Rachel Reeves has said, no one really pays attention to it, but she says that's one thing she wants to reform, how government procures things. Yes. Because well, it's so wasteful. I, I mean, I have my suspicions that there might be more to it than that, that mm. there are a lot of staff, civil servants, who work in the Home Office, yes. who would like our asylum system to be more generous, who mm. do not seem to regard accommodation which was fit for brave 
uh, military force personnel yeah. to live in, um, but they don't seem to view that as acceptable for right. migrants who've crossed the channel illegally. So they would have to spend more money and doing so them so that. So there perhaps is an incentive mm. there for Home Office staff who would like to have a more generous system in mm. place to drive up the costs, yeah. or at least not try to bring down the costs well, as much as possible. Paying... So you no know, wonder hotels are going to be cheaper. Yeah. But obviously, you know, you talked about the pull factor. A big problem is that if it, the perception is that by coming here in a dinghy, perhaps across the channel, you will then be put up in a rather nice air, you know, mm. a, yes. Airbnb, a B&B, yes. then you know, th that word will get around, yeah. and that might make the UK a more attractive place. That's not to say, of course, that all illegal migrants who are coming here are economic migrants. Right. Many of them, of course, are fleeing war-torn countries where they may be persecuted. But there does appear, look at the numbers, to be some abuse of our asylum I think there's system. a huge amount of abuse. And I think also a lot of people are not paying necessarily to come over, yeah. but they're being sort of hooked in by these gang masters and they're being... Yeah recruited effectively to come here and work in the black market or in criminal uh, activities. And so they don't pay, but what they do is they get sort of indentured yeah. and they get sort of, you know, almost like treated like slaves and they get told, when you get to Britain, you're going to work for us and then you'll pay off your debt to us and that will go on for years and years and years. Absolutely. And I think that's the problem. And it's absolutely horrendous and that's why we need to put the focus on, on the traffickers and, and that's the whole thing. It's not sending people to Rwanda. It's basically to act as that deterrent. Um, but people need to sort of spot that and, and call that out. Um, but that's the reality. There's all sorts of people. I think the FT said it's going to cost about 250,000 mm. per person they worked out to send them to Rwanda. Yeah. The figures are crazy. What we need to stop is stop those gangs. Yes. Yeah. But unfortunately, they make so much money yeah. that it's never going to stop because, yeah. like, the drug business in this country, you know, there's an awful lot of people that use drugs, and so there's an awful lot of people paying good money yep. uh, to these people to continue to bring the drugs in. And for the same reason, there's an awful lot of money in, in moving people around the world, mm -hmm. and they're doing it all over the world. So yeah. I don't know what you do about it. I mean, Australia claimed that they managed to pretty much eliminate the problem. So, yeah, I mean, but Australia is a long way away from anywhere, and so to come there on a boat is not quite as, as, as easy as it is, say, yeah, to come true. here from France. And if you're going to set off from, you know, Southeast Asia, in a boat on some very treacherous seas. It's a very different ball So that's game. something you have so, to think about. So I think yeah. the problem for us is the proximity yes. to, to Normandy, basically. Well, it's the proximity and also the message, as we say. Yeah. The message has to be, you're not going to stay here. Right. You're sent to Rwanda. Actually, this is the reality about what happens when you come here. Mm. Yeah. It's not staying in a nice hotel. You're going to be put into slavery, some of these people. And they're horrendous conditions. If we can work on that PR story to make sure that, that gets infiltrated, mm. that's going to be more powerful than all the other stuff. Well, there but was a story in the Daily Mail, I don't know if you saw it recently, a man who tried to come here from Iran yes. and he said that he was pretty much told by the traffickers aim for Britain don't yeah. aim for France right. and then he came here and was completely disillusioned by it and yeah. now he's actually claiming asylum in France right. so I mean people do have these sort of unrealistic expectations of what things are going to be like mm. when they get here yeah oh, I'm sure but, but nevertheless it's probably better than wherever they're coming from right mm. So well, why one they? certainly, yeah, exactly. One certainly expects so. Even if they're coming here as economic migrants, they're doing so in the pursuit of a better life for themselves right. and for their families. But Australia has shown us that offshore processing, that a scheme like Miranda can act as a deterrent. My concern is that the numbers who will be sent there, like we've discussed, are going to be so tiny, yeah, a yeah, portion of the whole, that it's not going to make any difference. And again, that's why it benefits the government that this is being delayed and delayed and delayed mm. because it's not going to have a measurable impact on the number of people who want to come to Britain, you know, yes. illegally um, and claim asylum. But what it will do is be a very symbolic moment for the Tories That's to show absolutely. people that yeah. this totemic policy... If it actually, if it actually happens. Let's have a look at uh, a bit of Prime Minister's questions today because we've got Keir Starmer, I think, calling for an election. Mm. Let's just take his Rwanda policy. When they first announced this gimmick, they claimed it would settle tens of thousands of people. The Home Office then whittled it down to a mere 300. Four times that number have already arrived this month, and the backlog stands at 130,000. Can the Prime Minister see any flaw in his plan to deport less than 1% of that backlog? I mean, it's right, isn't it? I mean, the trouble is, even if it does work, and, and, and Annabelle, I, I can see that you, you're hopeful that it might be something that will work. I just don't yes. see it making a jot of difference at all. I mean, Prime Minister's questions today was described as a place where everybody's just run out of things to say. They've run out of jokes. Apparently, um, something was actually said by a Keir Starmer that was quite funny, uh, where he basically said that, um, you know, the sword of Damocles is literally hanging over uh, the Prime Minister. Um, 
in, in, in actual real terms, in terms of the leader of the House of Commons. Of course, Penny Morden has got the actual well, sword. And, and, and was, he, he nixed that joke, actually, a couple of days ago, and I think it was the standard, yeah. there was that cartoon. Right. Um, the reality is this, and that the biggest gift to the Conservatives is that uh, is for, uh, Rishi soon had to turn around and say, look, we're trying to do something and Labour are stopping us. And if you've come up, if they've got yeah. no credible plans, that's a gift for them on that sort of basis. Uh, the whole point about Rwanda, as you say, it's supposed to be a deterrent to make people not go to Rwanda, but to stop the criminals. If there can be some progress, yeah. that's got to be good for them. But it's and a bit like the SNP strategy when Alex Salmond was in charge in Scotland, when he used to just completely blame Westminster for everything. Yes. The, the last thing you ever wanted to happen was to actually get independence. Oh, no, I, have gone, I, absolutely. oh, God, well, we actually have to work with it now. You know, it was much better for him to get up every day and say, those horrible people at Westminster keep stopping our great plans. Well, no, and at some point, Labour are going to have to set out a coherent yeah. agenda. There yeah. is no meat on the bones of what they are promising right. voters at the moment, certainly not when it comes to their plans for illegal migration. Yes. But I think Rwanda is important, not just in terms of getting those planes off the ground, acting as a deterrent, but also because so many voters, people particularly who voted for Brexit, mm. yep. feel very betrayed by the Conservative right. Party on immigration, legal and illegal. Yes. And they want to see the tough action taken. Yes. They want it to be shown that we have taken back control mm, of yes. our borders, that we are a sovereign nation, that we are abiding by our sovereign laws, by laws set in Parliament rather than those by some supranational European body. And at the moment, they just simply don't have confidence no. that that's what's well, happening. Well, they can't, because apart from anything else, about over one million people a year are being invited in to work and to study. So, you know, we don't have control, really. Well, we could have, but we don't. Anyway, listen, we'll have you all back very shortly. We're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Coming up next, we'll be talking uh, to the people from the London Clinic about the lunacy that's going on there after it was revealed an investigation has been launched into a suspected breach of Princess Kate's privacy at the luxury hospital. Do not go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth.
Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk TV. Now it's time for Taking the Mic. Now, you might say it's been a bit of an anus horribilis for the BBC these last 12 months. They've had the Gary Lineker tweeting scandals where he repeatedly appeared to breach their online guidelines for social media use. They've had countless accusations of bias in the news, particularly when it comes to covering the conflict in the Middle East. And only yesterday, one of their own employees was caught up in the Princess of Wales conspiracy vortex when she claimed that the recent pictures of Kate weren't actually her. And we haven't even mentioned Hugh Edwards yet. Not a great record, is it? Add to that the furore over the increased cost of the licence fee and Talk TV's very own investigation into the hounding of vulnerable people by debt collectors for not paying it. The public's view of the BBC has never been lower. And that view is obviously played out in real time by the figures. Millions and millions of people are deserting their radio stations and television channels and the percentage of people who trust the BBC for their news output is now in single figures. All the more reason, you might think, why the top bods at the Beeb might think this is a good time to reflect on where it has all gone so wrong and why so many people are now just giving up on the state broadcaster altogether. Well, as you might suspect, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Tim Davey, the current Director General, appeared before the Culture, Media and Sport Committee today to answer accusations that the BBC had ceased to be impartial and that the public had lost trust in the brand. Here's what he had to say. Um, overall, we're doing a good job in terms of delivering uh, impartial coverage amidst enormous pressure. One of the things I talk a lot about is 70% of the world now does not have a free press. The polarisation in society is profound. So any institution like ourselves to steer the course amongst the noise, the storms of social media is very demanding. Uh, no, you didn't mishear that. He actually did say he was proud of their output and that overall they were doing a good job in terms of delivering impartial coverage. I'm sorry, Mr Davey, but I would beg to differ. Exhibit A. Only yesterday he had to apologise to Richard Tyson Reform for referring to them as a far-right party. Exhibit B. Your senior foreign correspondent, Jeremy Bowen, refused to apologise for falsely reporting that Israel had bombed a hospital in Gaza, killing 500 innocent people. And worse than that, he admitted that he didn't even regret getting it wrong. The hospital was not bombed and 500 people didn't die. Exhibit C. You set up BBC Verify to check up accuracy on other media organisations, but Mariana Spring, the chief misinformation reporter, has admitted faking her own CV. And they've been accused of producing several blatantly biased pieces of work this year alone. All in all, it's a pretty dreadful look for the BBC, and I could find a hundred other infractions. Meanwhile, nice but dim Tim reckons the polarisation of society and the storms on social media might be making his job harder. Has he ever considered that the way the BBC reported on the Brexit debate eight years ago? Does it ever occur to him that that might have contributed to most of the polarisation? Who can forget the looks on the faces of all the presenters the night of the referendum result? And as for social media storms, I give you two words, Gary and Lineker. I've got some breaking news for the BBC. Your time is up. And now it's time for an update uh, on the Princess of Wales, Kate, of course, but not the one that everybody's hoping for. The CEO of the London Clinic has said all appropriate investigatory, regulatory, ugh, regulatory and disciplinary steps will be taken when looking at the alleged data breaches of the Princess of Wales and the files that she may have had looked at amid her abdominal surgery. Let's bring in Royal Commentator Robert Jobson. Robert, good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, it's a hell of a mess, this, for the, uh, the London Clinic, because it's been, for years, it's been the place where not just members of the royal family go, but a lot of famous people go for sort of what you might call discreet um, treatment. But this has really blown the gaff uh, off it all, hasn't it? I have to wait and see what they come up with this investigation. Yeah, the fact that someone's been trying to check out her uh, records is pretty appalling, and the fact is it's going to cause a massive problem for them going forward. Just, you know, ultimately, it's all about trust. And this is why people are paying the big bucks, not only for um, the best treatment, apparently, but also the, the discretion of the people involved. But, you know, it does seem here that there's been a, a blunder. We'll have to wait and see what happens with this investigation. But um, it's a huge story. It really is. And, I mean, 
Coming on top of the huge story that was, was, was here just a couple of days ago uh, when the video was released, the huge story before that, when the, 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 the news that, that she and, and William had been out in, in the farm shop, coming on back of that big uh, photo, photo, photographic scandal. I mean, the, it just keeps going on and on and on. I mean, the last time you and I spoke, Robert, I think you, like many people, were saying, you know, it's time to sort of leave her alone. But she, it's almost as though they keep sort of giving us more reasons not to. Yeah, and I don't think it's all down to Kate. I don't think it's her fault at all. I think the problem is the reality over the photograph. Yeah, that should have been checked by our own people. They should have asked the question. They should have made sure that it wasn't um, messed around with her doctor. She's, own, after all, an amateur photographer. She, you know, she's not been very well. I think it, they should have been all over this, but certainly not throwing her under the bus and they shouldn't say that it's all down to me, my fault. I think it's really down to the comms teams at Kensington Palace, personally, mm. because... Ultimately, they get paid big bucks to actually be in charge of these things and make sure things are put out correctly. But um, ever since then, it's just been more and more controversy, more and more problems. And um, it's not really, you know, even now we're getting videos that were in the sun, video and, and, and photographs that were in the sun that were pretty clearly uh, not, 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 you know, just casually, not with any makeup on, maybe a little thinner than normal, or just after recovering from, from her treatment. But now people saying it's not her. You know, I mean, the world's gone a bit nuts with all yes. this sort of stuff. Oh, I think it has. And in fact, in some ways, it's almost there's no way now to prove that uh, that, that whatever they think is not true because they're absolutely obsessed. And I think a lot of it is being fueled uh, by the United States of America. You know, a lot of it's fueled yeah. by this kind of you know team Meghan and Harry versus team William and Kate. You know, it's all become very toxic, hasn't it, between those two groups of people. And so the conspiracy theories are, are, are off, the, off the scale. But I said this to somebody last night, Rob. You know, this is similar now to when I used to take late night calls on my overnight show on Talk Sport from people who said they didn't believe the moon landings, they didn't believe that 9-11 uh, actually happened, it was an inside job, they blew up the World Trade Center from inside. You know, these are the same kind of people who are now saying all of the mad yeah. stuff. They're never going to be convinced. No, they're not. And every 20 minutes or so with this last weekend, I've been getting calls saying, oh, look, I've got it on the best authority, you know, the BBC are going to make a major yes. announcement any yeah, time that. now about, about, the, uh, about the royal family, you know, be on your... And they've got it on the best authority, it's not a made-up. And I just, at the end, was just saying, well, it is made up, it's, it's not going to happen. So it just shows you the power of the internet, the, shit, the power of the trolls and the power of, of these, these people that are putting out false right. information. It's not, I mean, the reality is you don't have to look at the video and you it's quite clearly her. Um, I don't think they help themselves. I don't think that William was skipping that. Um, the um, memorial service of King Constantine that really helped because it all started going on from yes. there. But when the and, the, and the picture itself was an error of judgment. So, um, but with a bit of luck, I think actually the, the video and the pictures that were put out, um, which were by the sun, will finally put an end to it. I do think that they will put an end to it um and even now you've got some of these people wearing free kate t-shirts well you know free her from what <laughs> um the fact is she's not she's not being held no. prisoner she's recovering from uh, treatment i mean i do think they made a mistake at the very beginning because if they were going to be very private about her procedure they should have just said she's going to hospital for a deeply private procedure and that was it yeah. not discuss things about abdominal or anything like that yeah. and that would stop all of these conspiracies yeah. because if it's private it's private and you leave it at that and and what is being said sort of behind the scenes, Rob? I don't want to, to put you on the spot because I know you don't want to give away any sources or anything like that. But but you guys like yourself, you talk to people sort of constantly. Um, is there anyone who's kind of going to be getting the blame for this? Because Kate kind of took it upon herself to take the blame for the the Mother's Day picture. But as you say, the whole comms team doesn't seem to have a clue about what strategy they should adopt. And so, I mean, is it what's being said kind of behind the scenes about are they, are they running around like chickens with their heads cut off or what? I think they're simply focusing on the next job, which was, you know, William doing his job to do with homelessness and putting information out about that. I think they're a little bit blind to the fact they've really made a mistake. Uh, they, I think that the palace itself... I mean, the problem they've got here is, is that even there's interfighting between Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace. Yeah. You've got people at Buckingham Palace saying, oh, look, oh, look at the mess up by Kensington Palace. What they don't seem to understand, Mike, is that if you're in Washington or Chicago, you only know of one palace, and it's the palace that's brand royal family, and it looks like a complete mess up from the whole of the royal family. And I think that's why, personally, I think they should probably go back to the future, if you like, and have one supremo in charge of all the palaces to do with media who'd have to report to the king. You know, come Monday morning, if you don't have a mess up like this, 
reporting to the king would be an easy thing to do. So making sure your troops all singing from the same hymn sheet would actually be the, a solution. Right. And um, that you wouldn't get people just putting stuff out without the amount of checks that is needed for an organisation that has to make sure it's got its authenticity and its integrity, which has completely been lost. Yeah, absolutely right. And it won't help, will it, that the Crown uh, is leading in the BAFTA nominations department um, while this is all going on, because I think a lot of this is also down to the fact that people have been watching the Crown, and I said this right from the beginning, you know, as soon as you start, in, you know, interpreting actual facts and making stuff up and putting it into what people think effectively is a documentary, you know, the view of the world on what's going on inside the royal family will be changed forever. And so now... You know, the crowd, I wouldn't be surprised if the Crown decides to have another new series. Well, they made a lot of money and they're very, very popular. And actually, if the royal family had embraced the Crown rather than just rejecting it, maybe that would have been a more uh, sensible way of doing things. They would have probably had more advisors on it and yeah. could have probably helped get it to be closer to the truth. I personally, in some of it, quite enjoyed the Crown. I think if you accept that it's a, 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 a work of fiction yeah. based upon facts rather than the other way around of, fact based upon somebody riding around it, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's quite enjoyable, but um, as a work of drama. And I think that's really all that they should be emphasising, that they've got good actors in there. They've, it's quite expensive, expensive production, but maybe they could have um, <laughs> got some more advice on it in terms of the accuracy. Yes. I mean, once again, even though there's no real story here, you know, the real story is more interesting than, than anything they could have made up. Well, I mean, we still don't know what's uh, what's wrong with what's happened uh, with Kate, and it's not really our business to know. You know, just because it's um, information the public wants to hear doesn't mean it's in the public interest. And I think that that's the point. You know, you and I, if we don't want our, our personal medical condition revealed, that's within our that's our prerogative, and it yeah. should be hers. I believe that they've done the right thing with the king because he's the head of state, and he's still got his constitutional role to play. But as it comes to Kate. It's a personal matter for her, and I think they've handled it wrong, but you know, quite badly actually. Yeah. But and it could have been done better from the start in terms of you know just little things like photographs of her um, looking at get well cards or yeah. photographs or video taken by Andrew Parsons, who's working for them actually already mm. to do a you know a, a, who was the guy working for Boris Johnson behind the scenes on all those. Mm. Video, you know, all that those photographs when he was at number ten, and, and other prime ministers. He's already there working with them to try to produce an archive. So why not get him, a trusted guy, to mm. take the photograph? Then it would, then it wouldn't have been messed around with. So there's been fundamental mistakes, but I think they probably learned from them, and let's hope it's not too late. Yeah, perhaps they're on the mend uh, after all. Robert, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Royal author uh, and journalist, of course, Robert Jobson, there uh, with the latest from Kensington Palace uh, or any palace. Will we hear from them before Easter? That's only over a week away now. We are watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, we'll be discussing Rishi Sunak's plan to ban anyone born after 2009 from buying cigarettes, as a shock study reveals that vapes also cause serious long-term health issues and damage to DNA. Do not move a muscle. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Smoke-free Sunak's plan to ban our kids buying cigarettes starts its journey into law today. The tobacco and vapes bill means anyone turning 15 this year or younger will never legally be sold a packet of fags, giving us some of the toughest anti-tobacco laws in the entire world. The bill will also try to turn children off vaping as well, bringing in new powers to restrict vape flavours and packaging that is intentionally marketed at children. Joining me now, though, uh, is the spokesperson for the UK Vaping Industry Association, Dr Marina Murphy. Marina, welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Nice to see you. Um, it's all a bit confusing, this, this, uh, this bill, because it seems to me that Rishi Sunak saw what they were doing uh, in, a, in a New Zealand, which yeah. I think was originally brought in by Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, and I think they've now backed away from it and they're not sort of doing it anymore because it's kind of mad, isn't it, to say to somebody who's born in 2009 you will always have to ask somebody else to get cigarettes for you, even if you're 50 years old, because that's effectively what they've done, right? Yeah, well, I mean, what you say is correct. They did originally conceive of this type of policy in New Zealand, but as you say, they've decided that um, it was problematic to try and implement it, not right. least because of things like a black market. Right. Um, and again, you also make a good point about the so-called objective being to prevent children from smoking. But, mm. but this, you know, and it's a prohibition, so let's just call it a prohibition. Yeah. This prohibition doesn't stop any child from smoking. It will only ever stop adults. Right. So it, in, my, in my view, it's not going to do what it's, what it's supposedly intended to do. It, no. it will only, I think, impinge on the freedom of adults, yes. ultimately. Because a lot of people have said today, when I've been hearing the various arguments being made, is that, you know, as long as cigarettes are legal, as long as tobacco is a legal substance, you know, what, what, what exactly right have you got to ban it, you know? Because they've banned drugs, haven't they? But, mm. you know, apparently Britain is now the cocaine capital of Europe. So, you know, there's not any difficulty. In fact, I think I read a story the other week saying that you can get cocaine delivered to your house faster than the pizza now. So, I mean, you know, outlawing things doesn't really work, does it? Well, and you're either an adult or you're not an adult. Mm. I mean, there shouldn't be degrees of adulthood. Right. It should be the case that if a product is legal, you should be able to have it. Mm. And also, I think um, it's kind of a pointless policy when you think about it, because the market is actually doing what they say that this policy will do. The market is pushing cigarettes out. I mean, mm. at the moment, I think we have the lowest level of smoking that we've ever had in this country, and we have the highest level of quitting. Right. And e-cigarettes have been really important, if not the most important, quit aid in this country. So the market is already doing that. Mm. Is so, it also a case of, um, you know, because cigarettes are so expensive, largely because of the tax that, that is collected on them, mm. that people are taking cheaper options? For example, whether it's vaping or whether it's actually e-cigarettes or whether it's just buying like you say, black market cigarettes. I mean, I, I used to smoke up until about, you know, seven or eight years ago, and I used to know loads of people who would go down to certain shops in certain parts of London and buy packs of cigarettes for four quid. You know, I never did it because I never really fancied doing it, but, you know, I assume that that's still a, a burgeoning market and nobody really knows how many people are they're using it, right? Well, the price point has always been really important. And, I mean, 
most of the people who smoke, you know, are not the most wealthy people in the country, right. we'll say. And in order to help somebody like that to move from a product and a behaviour that they understand mm. to something that they don't necessarily understand, I, I think you have to offer them an option that's cheaper in addition to being convenient, right. accessible, and that they like as well. And what about the vaping industry? What does this do to the vaping industry, if anything? Well, this bill, um, you know, obviously everybody's been waiting on tender hooks to see what's in the bill, but the bill doesn't actually prescribe any specific measures. But what it does do, and what I think is quite worrying, is it gives sweeping powers to the Secret Secretary of State, or I suppose more correctly, her civil servants, mm. which means that ultimately they can do what they want down the line with very little scrutiny. And the other thing that I think is problematic about this bill is the, the sort of indecent haste. You know, we've been waiting, yes. everybody's been waiting, and then you have the first reading today, and in the normal scheme of things, you would have a couple of weeks. I mean, right. people need to be able to read this bill, understand it, it was published today. Mm. And so they're gonna have a second reading, as I understand it, um, tomorrow. Right. So that seems to me to be so it feels like rushing it through. Are they Absolutely. Gonna... Yeah. And I mean, rushed legislation can never be good legislation. No. Also, it seems a bit odd, given all the problems that Britain's got right now, that mm. this is the one thing they want to focus on and they want to sort of, you know, put their marker down and say, exactly. this is what we did. We stopped people smoking in Britain. Well, exactly. so what? I mean, it's almost uh, distraction tactics, I would say. I mean, look what's going on with the Rwanda bill. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I, th I think they're basically sacrificing vapors for votes yeah because I mean they've made a big bang about it they you know they're talking it in the media mm. and bigging it up saying that this bill is designed to stop children vaping now nobody wants children to be vaping right. but the fact is that children aren't supposed to be vaping it's, right. a, it's illegal for anybody yes, who's under but children to vape. can buy vapes they can and people can sell them to well them. they are but that's the point again but it may well be illegal but that's never stopped them before I mean well, you know, I think I had my first cigarette when yeah, I was 11 yes you know yes most people do yes they and that do. was illegal as well. They do. And, and it we... was from my mother's cigarette packet. Yeah. And she found out and she wasn't happy. Yeah. But at the end of the day, kids will do things whether you like it or not. Well, kids and teenagers specifically, I suppose, um, like to take risks. Yeah. And you bring in laws, you know, so that you can reduce the impact of those risks or, or reduce the likelihood of them taking yes. those risks. Now, those laws are, already exist. And if you can't enforce that law, how are you going to enforce mm. all these other potential right. laws that they bring in? Right. If you cannot stop an 18-year-old vaping now, how are you going to stop a 25-year-old right. or, or a 40-year-old and then put people in the ridiculous position whereby the 39-year-old can't buy a cigarette but their 40-year-old yes. friend can go into the shop and buy right. a cigarette for them? I mean, trading standards have better things to do well, exactly. than police I mean, our, our shop owner is supposed to go... I think you're 39 yeah. as opposed to 40, so therefore yes. I'm not going to sell them to you. No, yes. they're not. But what about the difference between the vapes? Because when they sort of first announced this, they were trying to make out that there are certain vapes that they're against. Yeah. They're not against all vapes. Is that your position as well, or what's your position on that? Well, I mean, obviously they focus down on disposable vapes because, right. as we know, that they, they will be banned, but it'll be a different But instrument. they're more likely to be used by the, by the teenagers, are they? Well, if you look at the statistics, in the scheme of things, there's only a tiny, tiny fraction of, of a percent almost of vapor or teenagers who actually use vapes mm. at all. Right. But we're focusing down on that tiny number as opposed to looking at the bigger picture and thinking about what these vapes are intended for and the success that we've had in this country. You know, we're leading the way in tobacco harm reduction. Mm. And like I said, we have the highest highest quit rates and there are, are already laws in place that are supposed to be tackling this small number yes in the scheme of things well as you say it's already illegal isn't it yes it's already illegal so enforce that law right enforce that but are law. there specific types of vapes i suppose is what i'm asking you that, that you would rather as a as, as an official from the sort of the vaping authority mm. if you like that you would rather not see being sold absolutely i mean there are products that are clearly I suppose you would call them inappropriate. I mean, there's no need to have a vape that looks like a Pokemon or a Barbie doll. Right. I don't think that's necessary. I would argue, though, on the other side, that it's absolutely necessary to have flavours. I don't know why people are in denial that right. adults like flavours. Yes. So I think flavours is, is a must, mm. but something like a product that looks like a toy, I don't, that's not necessary. And it's not, it's not legal, but the way things are at the moment, the MHRA, which is the regulatory authority, doesn't have to approve the packaging. Right. So that's something that could be improved. Uh -huh. And obviously, you know, like a lot of these things, you know, the, the trend moves 
and it moves on. And like yeah. a lot of young women have always smoked because they think it helps them to keep their weight down mm. and, and they don't want to eat so much. And maybe vaping has the same effect on people. Um, but I've got a 17-year-old son um, who did vape for a bit and has now given up. So he's now a veteran of it and he says, oh, I don't really like it. And a lot of his friends have done the same. You know, they kind of they thought it was cool when they were 15. Yeah. But now when they're 17, they don't think it is. Yeah. So, you know, this all of this legislation seems to me to be um, very undemocratic, really. Well, it's, it's kind of virtue signalling, I think, at the yeah. end of the day. A lot of it is not going to achieve, like I said, what they say they want to achieve, which mm. is take vapes out of the hands of children. But you don't solve that problem by taking them out of the hands of adults. Yes. Adults who are entitled to have them if they want to have them and should be able to have them if they want to, say, switch or, or give up yeah, cigarettes. exactly. And what about the long-term damage? Because people don't know that much about long-term damage of because people haven't been smoking them or using them um, for Vape, long... Vaping for them. Long enough, vaping them, sorry. Vaping them, I don't even have the lingo. Um, so mm. what's being done about that? I mean, is there anything that you can tell us about projects that have been worked on, research that's been done? Well, there's a lot of research that has been done in, in the past 20 years. Um, and even here in the UK, if you look at University College London, yeah. they do a lot of research on e-cigarettes. And you have London South Bank University, you have uh, Queen's College. There are, uh, there's an awful lot of research being done in this country. So I don't think it's true to say that we don't know, you know, anything. We don't know everything, yeah. but we do know a lot. And, and you think, would say categorically it's better than smoking? Well, I mean, I don't even have to say it. You just have to look at what Cancer Research UK says. Yeah. They say it's better than smoking. If you look at what OAHID, which previously was Public Health England, if you look at what they say, yeah. they stay and they have stuck to their guns. They've said that 95% uh, safer than a cigarette. Now, something that's 95% safer, that doesn't mean that it's not, you know, that it is risk-free, mm. sorry. Um, it's not fresh air. So there is a level of risk, but the point is it's the comparative risk and yeah. what is the difference in your risk if you are a smoker versus if you were to switch mm. to vaping. Yes, absolutely. Well, listen, Dr. Maria Murphy, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, very appreciate much. it. I'm sure the arguments will be going on for a long time. I'll talk to the panel about it a little bit later on as well because, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll have an interesting view on all of it. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, uh, we'll be talking about the Prime Minister's rather optimistic appraisal of this country's financial future. See you shortly. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. And now, following news of a recession, defection and losses at by-elections, Rishi Sunak has welcomed better news of the UK's inflation rate falling more than predicted to 3.4%, which comes as a lifeline for the Prime Minister, who claims the new inflation figures show his plan is working and 2024 will be the year the economy bounces back. Oh, really? But do the voters believe him? I'm not so sure. Uh, and I'm now joined down the line by economist and market commentator Justin Urquhart Stewart. Justin, a very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic. Thank of you. Mike Thank you. Um, I think Rishi Sunak may go down in history as the most overly optimistic prime minister we've ever had because um, he thinks this is a year that not only the economy is going to bounce back, but that the Tory party is going to bounce back as well. Now, one of those things may happen, um, but I don't think it's the second one. I uh, pretty wishful thinking when you actually see what's happening. Yeah. Because, yes, inflation has come down, but that's not necessarily because we put interest rates up. Uh, it's actually what you've seen here is that uh, trade, the global trade has been slowing up. And we're seeing the effect of that. It's low, slow growth around the world. Mm. Uh, but the mistake I found that, the, in my view, the Treasury made is that actually then uh, with, the, with the Bank of England decided to put rates up really far too quickly. Yeah. And they should have actually done it well, four years ago to go from mute, well, from very, very negative, just neutral. Now you're in a position where you have to give people really expensive uh, uh, mortgage rises, which of course a lot of people can't afford. Right. So it's not a matter of just being lucky or not. Uh, it's actually, this is just bad management. Yes, and I don't know anyone at the moment who, despite the fact that interest rates have come back down by quite some amount over the past six to eight months, that feels any better off. I don't speak to anyone who suddenly says to me, do you know what, you know, now that interest rates are down again, I'm feeling so much more uh, like spending my money on expensive holidays and new cars and possibly another house. No, they're not doing it. No, it's amazing, but there's a common theme, theme, theme here, because in America, where I was last week, you can actually see a position where the economy's picked up quite significantly. Mm. Uh, still lots of sides saying, we're, we're employing now, come in and work here they're not actually getting enough people going through. Uh, so even though it's getting better in terms of the inflation, it's not really being reflected in people's confidence. Mm. So people don't feel as though they're winning in, on it. Uh, and so that's going to be the problem. That's exactly right. I mean, I think it came down, what, 0.2% the interest rate um, this, this time around. I mean, that's not going to yeah. make any difference whatsoever to somebody paying a mortgage, is it? No, it's a, it won't make any uh, much difference at all. Uh, it is, you know, just a figure which has been bouncing around. And now be careful, because they always like to say the Bank of England is independent. Well, is it? There's normally someone from the Treasury in there. All the members mm. have to uh, have to be uh, uh, vetted and checked on by the service, Secret Services. Uh, and they've got their own bank employees as well who have to be checked. Uh, and just to cap it all, a little person from the Treasury who puts hands up occasionally and say, I think we've made the wrong decision. So it's, it's hardly surprising, and it's vital we get this right, because otherwise a position where the primary driver of our economy is the consumer. And if the consumer can't spend because money's being taken out of, uh, uh, out of mortgage, it's just going to be dangerous. They right. didn't need to put rates up so far, so, so fast, and too late. They should really be thinking about this, you know, really when the, the difficulties were occurring, wait two years, and then bring it in gently. Merely yeah, saying it's going to be better later this year, well, so it's far, so it's far worse. Yeah, well, exactly right. It's not going to be better for Rishi Sunak later this year. I can pretty much determine that for sure. But, I mean, the other problem is, is they've made government so big now that they need to fund it to such an extent that they can't really give any money back to the, to the taxpayer. They can't really no. cut people's taxes because they need every single penny they can get their hands on. I mean, only, uh, only today the DWP confirms, what, the £500 million cost of uh, living support packages for this year. You know, they're talking about trying to clamp down on the £9 million plus people who are economically inactive. 
but sort of half of them are students. And another sort of yeah. quarter, at least, they're going to say they're unfit for work. They've got a massive problem. <laughs> They've got a huge number of people who are who are living in this country who are not generating any income for the government. And we have to keep yeah. subsidising them. Well, it's either that or we find an efficient way of trying to get them back. And I find it really very odd indeed mm. that uh, they can go to Rwanda and expect that's the end of the uh, issue. It's not. Uh, frankly, it would be much better speed up the... Uh, uh, asylum evaluations, and particularly people who've just swapped their passport mm. and also swapped their religion, and actually put a time scale on it as to how, how many hours people are going to have to spend yeah. uh, to make sure that we've got proper control of it. If they don't do that, it's going to be really very difficult indeed, and people believing that the Bank of England is all power to try and resolve this issue. No, it's not. This right. is a global issue as much as anything else. Well, this is the thing, and I mean, the only real, I suppose, bright light at the end of the tunnel for Rishi Sunak is that the Labour Party don't appear to have much of a plan as to how they would spend their money. Uh, and in fact, all we saw this week was Rachel Reeve saying uh, she's going to embrace her inner Margaret Thatcher, if only. Well, when I mean, you see these, these figures coming out, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense because they've got to be able to try and find something which is uh, a credible policy which they can fund. Yeah. Now, the problem, therefore, for the Labour Party, which is a lot of their good ideas for instance, the ability to harmonise uh, national insurance and income tax, but the Tories will now nick that one, so you've got to try and find something else to replace it. And that's going to be really difficult unless you're willing to start your government with yet more price rises. Yeah, absolutely right. Justin, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Justin. Thank look you, at Stuart there uh, on Rishi Sunak's incredible optimism that he thinks that not only is this the year um, that the economy will bounce back, but he also thinks it's the year that Rishi Sunak and the Tory party will bounce back. Well, I've got some bad news for him because I don't really think that that is in any way likely to happen. But, of course, the other problem that the Labour Party have got uh, is that, one, they've got Rachel Reeves, who is about as dull as dull can be. Um, she even makes Jeremy Hunt look interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, Labour haven't really got the answers and will be once again, asked to cough up even more tax money, no doubt, in order to fund all of the craziness that they want to do. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up in the next hour, we'll be talking about the crisis in the church as people complain uh, that if the Church of England pushed for diversity, it's actually alienating ordinary worshippers. Don't go anywhere. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. minutes, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have was moved another on from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Grammy with talk. We're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker. Coming up in this hour, the Prime Minister facing another Tory revolt after MPs rebelled over his plans to scrap short prison sentences. And civil service hysteria. A lawyer and the government department she works with are being sued after she said that only women menstruate. Plus, Nessie's back, the Loch Ness monster spotted emerging from water in footage found by a Hollywood star. Now, it's not easy being a Christian these days. I mean, even though Easter is just over a week away, it's hard to see anyone mentioning it anywhere, and especially at the country's headquarters of the Christian faith, the Church of England. If social media can be a window into the thinking of senior members of the clergy, you'd begin to wonder if Easter even existed. The Archbishop of Canterbury has a tweet pinned to the top of his account page which has nothing to do with Easter. Instead, it's all about Gaza and how he condemns the killing of Palestinian civilians. He also calls for an immediate ceasefire, but makes no mention of Hamas or their part in the conflict. Then he's got some nice pictures of a recent visit to the Canterbury Mosque for an iftar, because after all, it is Ramadan. There is one reference to Holy Week, but nothing on Easter. How very odd, or perhaps not, from Archbishop Wokeby. Meanwhile, church leaders have appointed several racial justice enablers tasked with addressing white fragility, despite being warned that they might be alienating ordinary worshippers with their plans. They've targeted several dioceses in England for this special treatment. In Birmingham, an anti-racism practice officer has been given the job of deconstructing whiteness in the West Midlands. God help us. And in York, they're advertising for a racial justice enabler after noting that only six out of its 280 ordained priests are non-white, serving the predominantly white community. The winning applicant will be involved, in their words, in a process of culture change across the whole diocese, helping to address unconscious bias. Also, they'll be tasked with using the Being White programme to work with senior leaders to address issues of white fragility. Whatever that is, I don't know what it is. Christ alive! According to the Reverend Guy Hewitt, who is head of the church's racial justice unit, I kid you not, it is, in his words, vital to stand against the evil and pernicious sin of racism. He added, this is not about a culture war, this is about the very epicentre of what the gospel calls us towards. I suppose it's great news for the devil. He used to be the main focus of the church's battle against evil. Now apparently it's racism. I didn't even know that was a sin. And I've checked. The seven deadly sins are still pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath and sloth. Seven. No mention of racism at all. Whatever would the apostles make of it all? Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, let's take a look at tomorrow's Metro and a very big headline and a very complicated and serious case. Fentanyl Phantom. Uh, it's a picture of a man uh, whose plotter, a, name, a double killer by the name of Luke DeWitt, created a cast of 20 Phantom characters during his two-year plot to poison a millionaire couple and steal their business. He ingratiated himself by doing chores uh, for Carol and Stephen Baxter, both in their 60s. He prepared medicine for them um, and he laced it all with fatal doses of the opioid fentanyl and other drugs. He's obviously in court. He used 20 fake personas. Um, he's guilty and he's found guilty by um, a judge and a jury poisoner who watched his own victims die. We'll talk more about that coming up um, as the panel return uh, for more stories from the papers coming up uh, later on in the show. Right now, though, Rishi Sunak faces another revolt from Tory revels, this time over prison sentences. The Prime Minister plans to scrap short sentences to ease overcrowding in jails. 
But 43 Conservative MPs, led by his predecessor, Liz Truss, are seeking to toughen up the sentencing bill. And it comes as Ministry of Justice data has revealed that one in five Muslim prisoners is actually white, amid fears that Islamic gangs are driving conversions. Joining me now is Vanessa Frey, a former prison officer and author of The Governor, My Life Inside Britain's Most Notorious Prisons. Vanessa, thanks for uh, coming on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Nice to see you. Um, I don't know whether you feel the same as I do. It feels as though Rishi Sunak's just kind of opened a drawer and gone, right, let's do prisons. Let's do, uh, what, smoking? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do the Rwanda bill. Let's do, you know, it's like, come on, we're covering up, hurry up to Easter. Let's get a load of stuff done without really giving it any thought at all. Well, I think Rishi, Rishi Sunak's clock is, uh, biological clock is ticking, isn't it? Mm. Um, and he's trying to cover as much ground as he possibly can <laughs> before doomsday. Yes. Um, I think, um, to be honest, I think um, this this move by the government is reactive rather than proactive. Yes. You know, we've known for months, since actually 2007, that we have issues with our prison system and our justice system, that we are running short of um, beds. You know, the predictions... Um, now are in the in the next couple of years are gonna they reckon it's going to be over a hundred thousand prisoners locked up in this country yeah um, and of course as the conservatives will say themselves they are the party of law and order and like to lock people up um, and uh, they are the masters of their own making with um, the state of our prisons these these days you know for many many years they have been um, completely lacklustre in investing in not only our prisons, but also on our reducing reoffending. Right. And we are where we are now, where there's just over 200 uh, male prisoner places. And, uh, you know, that that is just not acceptable. It's not safe. It's not safe for the public. Um, should we lose a prison, we will be um, up the creek without a paddle mm. because we will have nowhere to put these prisoners. Um, and so I think, you know... The, the fact that um, the prisons minister has uh, has said about, you know, uh, the early release scheme, it's nothing new. Jack Straw did it in 2007. So the Labour Party can shout all they want, but they've done it. And theirs lasted for three years, their early release scheme. Right. So I'm, I, I've, I've, I've read um, Liz Truss's and Suella Braverman's um, recommendations in amendments to the bill. And quite frankly, I'm not sure how they're going to manage that. One is um, the judge has to be assured that um, the prisoner won't reoffend if he gets a suspended sentence. And I'm not sure how, how they're going to manage that. And also the, the judge is going to judge the risk to the public. Well, he's not qualified to do that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's reactive rather than proactive. And uh, unfortunately, it's a... It's a bitter sw pill to swallow mm. for many of the victims of crime. Yes, of course. And I'm interested in what you said there about who's qualified to judge whether someone is safe to be released back into society because at the moment that whole system doesn't seem to work very well. The parole board seems to release people back into society uh, who clearly shouldn't be, and we know that because they keep getting recalled. What would you suggest then is a better method of judging who could be re-released back into society? What, who, who do you think should judge it? Well, I think it's got to be a multidisciplinary team. It's got to be um, disciplines from all all aspects, both inside and outside jail. Um, you can't just have it on, um, you know, the say so of one person. Right. Um, you know that that is how sort of sex offenders are released um, at at this point in time. Now, it's um, every every case is looked at on its own merit, the offence, um, the threat to the public. Uh, the uh, thoughts of the victim, uh, the the psychologist, the psychiatrists, mm. the uh, sex offender um, staff who have worked with the prisoner. You know, it's a whole it's a whole uh, multidisciplinary mm. team that looks at it, and uh, that is the only true way that you can that you can, you know, and even that isn't fail safe. Mm. You know, um, 
<laughs> we're dealing with pres uh, with human beings, and human beings can be unpredictable. Yes, there and is no also... fail-safe way to do it. No, of course, and you're also dealing to a large extent with some very manipulative individuals who um, want to get Absolutely. out again in order that they can commit further crimes, and they're very good at hiding their kind of um, you know dangerousness, I suppose, uh, when it suits them. But let me ask you as well, because you know the system inside and out. When people are in prison, I'm told by those who have worked in them that there's very little by way of rehabilitation that goes on currently because of the overcrowding, because of the, the lack of staffing, because of the lack of money. There's not much rehabilitation. Could you suggest another form of rehabilitation? And would you? I mean, in terms of, say, if he doesn't want to send so many people to prison, could we send them somewhere else? Could there be a sort of halfway house? Could there be a work detail? You know, could there be something other than prison which would have them, you know, being kept an eye on, but being given something useful to do? I think uh, to, to think about in the country, you know, we're, we're good at focusing on locking up and all things a year and got to be on now. Uh, and they had complete... We're just losing so you there, um, Vanessa. Let me just um, try... We'll try and get you back and uh, see if we can get a slightly better line. We're just losing some of your, your words there because I quite like to hear what you've got to say. What I'm basically putting to you is whether or not it would be possible to do something other than just send people to prison where, by the looks of things, they might be uh, mixing with people who will do them more harm than good, mixing with people who might teach them more crimes than they already know, uh, and in some cases, obviously, from the figures we've got today, might actually um, convert them to Islam. It's rather ironic, I suppose you might say, isn't it, where uh, you've got a lot of illegal asylum seekers, illegal migrants coming to Britain and converting to Christianity. Uh, it looks like you've got a lot of Christianity people, uh, or Christians even, going into prison and converting to Islam. But we'll come back to that. I think we've got you back, Vanessa, so let's see if that's a better line. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just interested in what you had to say. If there is any... Is there a middle ground? I mean, could we find something a bit more modern than just locking people up? You know, I'm not a great believer in, uh, uh, in, in, in not punishing people. However, you know, could we make them better individuals, better members of society, if we gave them something to do? Well, I think I think as a society we need to we need to have a think about what we actually want. Do we want to lock over a hundred thousand prisoners up, for, many for first offences, mm. non-violent crimes, or do we want to invest in reducing offending, um, addressing the, their offending behaviour? And uh, you know, this is not something that we're not very good at in this country. We lock up the most people in Western Europe, and we have the worst reoffending rates mm. in Western Europe. The, the 12 month and under sentence doesn't work. It's been proved it doesn't work. The Prison Governors Association has been harping on about this for years and years and years, um, asking various governments to listen. And at each stage, they fail to do it. All we actually do is keep people in prison for short sentences where when they're released, they go out, they've probably lost um, their support systems in the community. They've lost their, may have lost their job, their home, their their relationships. Um, but what they have done is have six months of uh, comforts with hardened criminals and learnt how to do it properly. Yeah. So once they get on that that crime uh, merry-go-round, it's very difficult for them to get off. Yeah, right. We don't seem to address the the uh, causes of crime. So you know, like addictions, homelessness. Um, uh, drug abuse, that sort of thing, and um, and that's where we need to focus on. And yeah. also, you know, first offences, short short term sentences are much better served in the community yeah. these days. You know, the GPS tags are very very um, much more technical than they they were when they first came out. Um, you're able to pinpoint exactly where uh, uh, a, an offender is at, and at what time. You can monitor them much better. Um, I think I think the the issue is is about releasing um, um, short term prisoners into the community and getting them to do something useful in the community that they've offended against is is something that we really need to consider and and move forward with um, and basically catch up with the rest of Europe because I think you know we're we're not doing ourselves any favors you know each prisoner place costs 47,000 pounds or just over per prisoner per year mm. and uh, that's an awful lot of money to spend on keeping somebody incarcerated for a yeah. first time non-violent crime right 
Yeah, absolutely. Vanessa, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Vanessa Frake there, uh, former prison governor, of course, worked there uh, and wrote a book called The Governor. You'd have to say as well, wouldn't you, uh, quite a few foreign prisoners in our prisons, which we're also paying for, which doesn't make much sense at all. But you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham, and I've got some stunning footage of the Loch Ness Monster for you after the break. You will not want to miss it. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was move on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham moving onwards and upwards to Scotland because images that appear to depict the Loch Ness Monster have once again taken the internet by storm. Well, the picture you're seeing now is from 1934 because, sadly, we can't show you the new images this evening because they're just a little bit too scary, quite frankly, and that's why we're not going to do it. But don't worry, we will one day show them. Futurist Andrew Eborn is back with me and I'm also joined now by none other than the registrar of the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register, Paige Daly. Paige, welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi Mike, it's so great to be with you this evening discussing these interesting photos that have come from Loch Ness. Yes, I mean, can you describe them to us? Because, you know, I've seen them, obviously, yeah. but um, um, and we think that it might be a bit too much to show them to everybody at this stage. Yeah. So why don't you just tell us Definitely. what you make of them, what they look like? Yeah, so if I was going to describe it to the viewers, I would put it down to being something strange in the water and potentially looking like a disturbance of potentially maybe bubbles coming out. And, you know, that kind of leads me on to it being great to be here this evening discussing what we're now terming 
bubble gate about what's happening here at Loch Ness. Yes. Well, Loch Ness is a fantastic place. I didn't realise, Andrew Eborn, until today... Yes. ..that you were somebody equally fascinated by the Loch Ness Monster. I, I love it. As, as I am, you know, cos I've been... T I get ridiculed repeatedly by people who think that, as a, as a normal, rational human being, I shouldn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Well, but I always have. I, I think you absolutely have to. We are discovering things every single yeah. day. There are dinosaurs being discovered. Well, we have discovered so a dinosaur, didn't we, just off the coast of absolutely. Morocco? Absolutely. Only the other day. Exactly. Right. So we should. And what I love about it, there's been 1,156 sightings of Nessie, this glorious site uh, which they have, which you can get your own sighting. And it goes all the way back in history. So you can go all the way back to 565 AD. Really? Was the first sighting of one of these wonderful serpents Blimey. in there. And it's not the only lock in Scotland. There have been lots of other locks in Scotland who claim to have monsters. But Nessie, I think, is glorious. And I've seen the pictures today, and yes. they're pretty frightening. I think so. Let me go back to Paige. I mean, as far as your registry is concerned, I mean, what qualifies for you to have to register a sighting? Does it have to be checked out by your um, your worthy research team? Absolutely. So there's quite a process to get a sighting on the register of sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. Now, it's so important to stress that we're really looking at un known sightings of something in Loch Ness, this creature that keeps on appearing. And of yeah. course, the one that's come out to the press today, or yesterday rather, is one that we've put forward to some academics that brought forward some really interesting interpretations of what was found in Loch Ness. Right. Now, the woman who took these pictures is a woman by the name of Chi Kelly, um, who says she took them <laughs> five years ago, but didn't release yeah. them before because she was frightened of being ridiculed. I, I know what that's like, so I don't blame her for that. Um, but have you registered these pictures then? Are you, are, you, are you giving them the kosher kind of seal of approval? Now, this is where Bubblegate really comes into play. Yes. We were really excited when we first saw these images last summer that Chi Kelly rightfully brought forward to Steve Felton, the Nessie hunter. Now, we were confused, as is everyone else, as to what this was, so we reached out to our wider team of experts and we actually put this forward to a professor of marine science and he decided and determined, really, that what we could be seeing might not be the Loch Ness Monster and could be scuba divers causing bubbles and the what? disturbance in Loch Ness. <laughs> wow. Well, no, well, that, would be, actually... that would be disappointing. Uh, or it could be the monster yeah. scuba diver, of yes. course. There's always that possibility. Andrew, I yeah. understand you've got a picture of your own. Oh, oh absolutely. Well, well, we've got a few of these bits and pieces. So yeah. what I love is that the, the famous picture, which you showed at the very beginning, was 1934, which was Colonel Robert Wilson. Yeah. And that was previously debunked. Uh, friends of mine from Japan yeah. are up in Loch Ness at the moment. Yes. And this is the picture they took just this okay. afternoon. And if you look very carefully in the background, over in the distance, you can see the tiniest thing, uh, possibly the bubbles there. Yes. Uh, one of the I'll tell you what, that's the that. nicest weather I've seen Isn't that Loch Ness lovely? ever. They this were very, glorious. very fortunate. Whenever, whenever I get to Loch Ness, which is not as often as I like, it's always absolutely tipping it down with rain. Yes. And it's a very dark and foreboding-looking place. Quite haunting, I think. Yes, well, well all credit. Uh, Lily Ono is, is the okay, lovely well person. Okay, well done, Lily Ono. She, she sent me yeah. that picture. Stay there until you get a picture that we can actually use. <laughs> it looks like there's a monster, please. Thank you. But talking about the bubbles, the real, the lots of theories about Nessie and what they sort of turn around, they think it might be logs that go down and eventually get aerating, they no. go up to the top, and that's why you get the log things. There's, but as I say, it goes all the way back to 565 mm. AD yes. with that first report of these serpents Incredible. and so on and so forth. And, and one of the reasons, Paige, that people believe that this could be possible is that there is, is there not, a channel which leads from Loch Ness out into the sea, which means that the, the, the serpent, the creature, would not necessarily have to be in the loch permanently. Yes, obviously Loch Ness is connected through a few different channels out to the sea. So there are many, many wide open interpretations of what could be going on in Loch Ness and what these mysterious things are that we're seeing. But yes, this one that's been brought forward by Chi Kelly is just another one added to the mixture and really bringing forward quite a few different interpretations of what this mystery could be in Loch Ness. Yes, and it's a, 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 a sort of everlasting Legend, isn't it, really? Because people love these kinds of stories. They love the idea that they can visit a place where there might be something slightly odd going on. And I think it is a kind of magical place for me. Definitely. The history at Loch Ness is so rich. And as your friend has pointed out, he's it goes all the way back. <laughs> Sorry. No, he's, not, he's not my that's, friend. That's no, a bigger just, myth than the monster. Paid, <laughs> paid to be here. <laughs>
<laughs> oh well, you know, whatever way your it's friends right. are. Okay. Um, yeah, it still goes back to 565 AD. There's a rich history of these sightings of something unexplained. And yes, it just brings forward people to the area searching for answers about this mystery and hoping that they get a glimpse of this mysterious thing living in Loch Ness. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I take it you have, of course, been up there yourself. Oh, I absolutely. I, I go everywhere. Do you? You know, I know do, that, yes. yes. What, what I love, there, whilst there may be people who do not believe in the Loch Ness Monster, there is nobody on this planet who would not be overjoyed if we actually discovered that Nessie was there and you've mm. got a real picture. So I, I love the idea. I love the fact that there are over a thousand sightings that yes. go all the way back. It's a wonderful history. It's brilliant for bringing the tourists in, as included from yeah. Japan, as I oh, say. Of course. So absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's also now quite a famous spot for um, people to rent boats. There's, yes. There's guys that go out. There was a guy, I think I remember, who walked... Um, around the base of, of uh, the, 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 the lock yeah. bed, if you like, dressed with one of those old-time diving outfits. It walked all the <laughs> way around, took him ages. You know, it's a, it's a fabulous place. And, I mean, as far as this set of pictures is concerned, I mean, will there be a moment that when you can register them or, or are you leaving that up in the air at the moment? No, so we originally did register the photos, but with the evidence that's been brought forward by the Professor of Marine Sciences, I really don't think we can turn our nose up to that. And I really do feel what he's brought forward is such a strong argument that we have to err on the side that this is most likely not the Loch Ness monster this time. Love for it to be Nessie, but hey, there's plenty of opportunities to capture a glimpse yeah. of the Loch Ness monster. Just got to get snapping, just got to get to Loch Ness yeah. to see them. Might have to make another trip up there. I, I, I don't, let's just go together. We'll have a field we trip. Yeah. I love it. We'll can can I of, ask, Paige? Play, I might, a, play a bit of golf, maybe. We'll play, we love a bit of golf. Can I ask, Paige, that you've got 1,156 sightings on your website. Have you counted this as the sighting? This sighting, it, this sighting is not included in. So it's not. So in it the could be 100, 1,157. That's interesting. Yeah. No, she's not going to. She's no, not going to register no. this one, I'm afraid, yeah, because no, uh, she's not. Con she's not convinced that it's the right thing to do. No, unfortunately, we can't go against such strong evidence from a professor of marine sciences. Yeah. He's a scuba diver himself. He knows the location to be locally used by scuba divers. Unfortunately, in this occasion. It's most likely bubbles, but don't worry, guys. The debate is ferocious mm. online about this, and people are really bringing forward all different arguments. But on this side, I do have to side with science on yeah. this one, and I Absolutely. don't think it's a Loch Ness monster. Listen, Andrew, thank you very much. It's a real indeed. pleasure. I really love it. Really good to see you. Andrew. We will organise that trip. Um, Paige, let me just ask you one, one final thing. I mean, if you are scuba diving in Loch Ness, what are you scuba diving for? What are you looking for? So um, a lot of the time they actually use Loch Ness to wash salt water off of their kit because they're going diving out in the North Sea as well. So it's a good area for that. And some local tour companies operate diving in the, the shallow areas of less than 20 metres right. so that people could maybe go and find the Loch Ness monster for themselves that way. It must be pretty dark down there. Though. You can't really see much, would you? Yeah, after nine metres you lose all visibility. So I don't know how much of a tour that is for people, but hey... Who am I to stop them going in Loch Ness? <laughs> uh, no, no, you should be inviting more and more people up there to check it out. But this is great. Thanks to see. Nice to see you. Absolutely brilliant. Um, we've got, of course, uh, Paige Daly there, registrar at the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register. Well done, guys. Um, we're going to get the panel back in, of course, because uh, you're watching uh, the Independent Republican Mike Graham, and that's what we do. Uh, we've got them all here. Uh, Candice Holdsworth is here. Uh, and, of course, Annabelle Denham. And Eve Taffick is, is here with us for the first time. Welcome to all of you. Loch Ness monster stories. I mean, if you've ever been to Loch Ness, you probably haven't seen one, uh, one of the, the, the famous pictures of it. But I mean, I'm a great believer in this thing. Mm. Um, it's great for Scottish tourism. If you haven't been there, you should definitely go. Yeah. Have you been? I mean, I, I'm personally not fascinated by it, but I am fascinated by people who are fascinated yes. by it. Yeah. Fascinated by the fascination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the way in which it's endured. It's well, I mean, you know, nonsense, if you want to have conspiracy but... theories about things, it's, it's less damaging than having it about Princess of Wales. It's true. You know, you can think yeah. about a lot less monster. It doesn't do anybody any harm. Yeah. Unless, of course, true. it gets you between its jaws. <laughs> but, um, yeah, anyway, listen, welcome uh, and, and thanks for getting you back. Let's talk about smoking, first of all, because that's one of the big stories today. Uh, we had the uh, woman here representing the vaping industry saying that basically because of the vaping industry, more and more people are not taking up smoking or giving up smoking. What's your take on this new law? I just think it's going to make Britain a bit of an outlier. Mm. I mean, New Zealand reversed their ban. They don't, they're not doing it, are they? They're not 
doing it. I, I don't know. I feel like we're, we're sort of at the cusp of where, you know, people are taking a lot of a lot more responsibility for their personal health. Mm. And it could be a very empowering thing if it's more based on the individual. But I think what we're seeing is the sort of rise of population level health interventions. Yeah where you get public health officials getting so much power and wanting to outlaw things like vaping. I mean, you've even heard people trying to get rid of cigars and yes. things like that. And I just want, I just hope that that's not the direction we're moving in. I mean, I know Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, he's very much in favour of population health interventions. And in fact, they think that this bill will pass through Labour, mm. actually. It's not, you know, something that many Conservatives... Well, this is another hangout from COVID, isn't it? You know, the interventionist types of, of health care. I mean, I've, I've heard a couple of the MPs who were pushing this bill saying, you know, well, of course, it will save the NHS a load of money. You know, we want to stop people from smoking because it's bad for them. And you listen to the way they speak and you just think, well, what's it got to do with you? Sorry. You know, one, a lot of smokers die quite young, so that doesn't cost the NHS very much. They pay an awful lot of tax in order to support whatever treatment they might need to get. And I think it's a net benefit in fact, for the NHS, for all the treatment they have to give that's, out. That's absolutely right. Smokers subsidise non-smokers yeah. by dying younger and through the taxes that they pay, which are extortionate. Right. Um, no, this is pure nanny statism. It's paternalism. It's a hangover, as you say, from COVID, when the government got very comfortable with telling us mm. exactly how we ought to yeah. live our and lives. And how dangerous it, it would be for you to do something other than what they told you. Well, exactly, and it strips people of their autonomy, of personal responsibility. Ultimately, it's up to the individual what they put in their bodies yeah. and I don't think anybody in Britain today believes that smoking is good for them right. of course they don't but they make trade-offs we all make trade-offs in our everyday lives we take on risks because we think that the benefits are worth yeah. it and I think you know, it might be easy for the government to malign smokers and in fact there's a long history of prime ministers attacking smoking yes. when they're on the ropes which Rishi certainly is at the moment but when it comes to the specific policy it's completely illogical mm. It will stop um, HMRC from bringing in revenues of around £2.2 billion yes. pounds a year. And that's before that's a you lot consider of money. VAT. Yeah. It'll, uh, there'll be, you know, prohibition doesn't work. It's going to have right. all the problems of criminal gangs uh, rising. There'll be a black market mm. for cigarettes. And on this specific policy, the fact that it's graduated, you're going to have uh, different rules for some adults to others. It'll yeah. be a two-tier society. So very quickly, the, the ridiculousness of this plan will become apparent and then the government will feel as though it's got little choice mm. and will probably have a Labour government by this stage, but to just issue an outright ban right. and then people won't be able to smoke in Britain anymore. But except, you know, that will be like the out, out, like outright ban on cannabis and cocaine and all the other things that people do, uh, even though they're supposedly illegal because people don't stop doing things they like doing. No. Eve. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. I don't think this is going to stop anyone smoking. The black market concerns I completely agree with. People just go abroad, buy them abroad, and um, that money will go elsewhere. Yeah. You know, or you'll get people buying big packs and just selling them for a fiver to their right. mates. It's not going to stop. Well, that happens smoking. a lot now anyway, doesn't it? Because yeah, obviously it smoking tends to be now more prevalent, as I suppose it always was, um, in kind of poorer parts of the country. You know, so they tend to get cheaper cigarettes. They tend to get smuggled cigarettes mm. that come in. And that still happens an awful lot. I mean, I haven't smoked for, God knows, eight, nine years. Um, but there were so many ways of getting cheaper cigarettes. Somebody was always, you know, selling you some off the back of a lorry or whatever, you know. And I just don't... I, I don't know why they're obsessed with it. And also, why force the issue? I mean, it seems... They haven't mentioned either... cigars either, have they? Well, 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 smoking's declining anyway. Younger people aren't really doing it. But I think there was a study that came out that said that more people are sp smoking cigars since the pandemic, but loads of people have rubbished that data. It was from some uh. public health body, and I think it was trying to... They were also trying to get any form of smoking banned. Yes. You know, but then uh, Christopher Snowden from the IEA was on a podcast with me and he said, can you imagine that? Someone's not able to just have a cigar at their wedding. Right. You know, just a moment of personal pleasure. somebody's going to come in and arrest you for it. Yes. It does seem mad. And also, they will next move on to food. They'll say, you can't eat that. That's can't it. sell yes. that. You can't so, buy that. Yeah. No You've mistake. already had one McDonald's hamburger. You can't have two. No, exactly. The, the, the nanny status will never be satiated. No. They will always open up a new frontier. They will never be uh, satisfied that, with the victories which they have. Mm. And if it's not smoking, then it's vaping. Already we've moved yeah. on to. 
how we're going to clamp down on vaping, despite the fact that um, it's been a very useful harm reduction mm. tool. It's been a substitute for smoking. Of course, nobody's pretending that vaping is good for you, right. but it is a lot less damaging for your health, according to a wealth of data and evidence than smoking yeah. is. And if it's not vaping, then it will probably be alcohol. How long is it before they try and clamp down on that? Because that more 11 to 15 yeah. year olds regularly drink alcohol than vape. Right. And then, you know, as you say, food already, there's a war being waged mm. on so-called big food right. um, and efforts to clamp down and on... And sometimes they get it wrong. I mean, we did a story here a few weeks back about how people are now moving back full, to, to full-fat milk and full-fat yoghurt and full-fat butter because actually a lot of the messaging from the health people and the so-called scientists was wrong, yes. telling you that you yeah. shouldn't have full-fat milk because actually it's better for you than the skim milk. And it can change because that's the scientific method. Yeah. I mean, our knowledge on things can evolve and mm. it can revise and you know you need to be in that position where you can change accordingly instead of having fixed laws around right. things exactly i mean smoking is probably you know not something that many people argue for i mean a lot of people i know are just like oh who cares about smokers right. but i mean when you start moving into things like yes alcohol and food well, when you miss the money that's when you care about them i mean that's yeah. the point and smokers probably care about smokers but i think arguably the worst part of all of this is that it's being imposed on us by a so-called conservative yes. government you might expect this from labor but do the tories really want to spend their final months in office bringing in a football regulator completely unnecessary yeah. measure to yeah. banning things bringing right. in new laws rather than f trying to identify ways of deregulating of rowing back the size of the state yes. and you know perhaps restoring some conservative yeah i said the other night i don't think i've ever known the state to be bigger than it is now in, in my lifetime yeah. let's talk about the garrett club though because this is one for the uh, ladies isn't it <laughs> uh, men only clubs i don't know what they're about really to be honest i've, I've been in a couple of them um, and i find them all a bit weird but yeah. tonight um, having said that he wouldn't resign, the story basically is that somebody got hold of the, the guest, the, the members list of who was actually in the Garrick, very old fashioned sort of, you know, establishment club in Covent Garden in the West End. Um, and it revealed that Simon Case, uh, who's the top civil servant in the country, and Richard Moore, the head of MI6, were in it. Simon Case yesterday said that he was going to remain in it because he wanted to fight for equality from the inside. Because, uh, because that was the best way to do it. Because he said, if everybody who wants women in the club leaves, then women will never get into the club. Today he's resigned. He, he never gets a positive headline. He Poor really doesn't. Simon I don't know how he's the he top civil servant. He tries very hard. <laughs> he never, never gets positive. How is this guy the top civil servant in the land? I mean, he doesn't appear to make very many right moves, does he? No. I don't have an issue with men only clubs personally. I mean, I don't care about them, but no, I don't no. want to be in one. No. I think we fight for female-only spaces, so yeah. it's, it's... Are there I, any I women-only really... clubs? There was. There was one for a brief while called The Wing. Do you remember The Wing? Yeah. It was like a, a female-only working space. But what space. happened? They all couldn't stop arguing with each other, so they shut it down. It was actually... <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's interesting. Sorry. There was... Listen, I can get away with saying that because I'm an old, white, heterosexual male, so <laughs> if you don't there like was... it, you know what you can do. There were two things. I think the pandemic <laughs> happened, so people weren't working at the office as much, but then there was a lot of internal strife at the company, actually a lot of accusations right. flying back and forth, and the CEO... Because there's resigned. a lot of... I mean, I was once invited to... Um, White's, which is a, I think it's still there, I don't know, it was a long time ago when I was working in newspapers and I was writing by my editor for lunch with him. And I just found it a very weird experience. It's, it's just down the road from the Ritz and it's a beautiful building and I mean, it's always lovely to go to these places because they're so amazing and mm. historic and all sorts of famous people were members of it. But I just found it really odd sitting in a room like a restaurant but with only men. Yeah. There's literally no women there well, at all. The staff were all men, the customers were all men. I just thought it was a bit odd. Yeah, it depends. Like whether you, some men do like having mixed company; they prefer us. Whereas I think some men, it's I don't know. It's a bit of a sort of boarding school hangout. That's over, what I think. I think it is. You know, for men who only went to school with other men. You know. Yeah, so it's uh, all men colleges at university. Yeah. But I like Candice. I don't have an issue with all no. men's clubs, just as we women have fought to have women only spaces. Yes. I think it's an entirely reasonable proposition. There are many former all, uh, all men's clubs which have uh, opened their doors mm. to women. Great. But if they choose not to or their members vote against it, then they should yeah. be free to do so. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I used to be a member of a golf club actually in Richmond where. Um, they had a sort of a, a men's section of the club and a women's section of the club, but they also had a mixed bar. But there was a men's bar where women weren't allowed to go. And Richmond Council refused to offer them a licence one year and said, if you don't make the whole club completely unisex, we won't give you a licence to sell drink. 
And a lot of places have fallen foul of that because sometimes the local authority just says, well, we're not going to give you a liquor licence or a, you know, an alcohol licence, and then they have to sort of move along with it. Mm, so I'm not sure how they get along. But, I mean, does it matter that these guys have resigned? I mean, Simon Case was, uh, has now said he resigned because he realised it was not a, a good look. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah but I think that's I mean, a bit a bit feeble to, it is, back, isn't it? to backtrack on yeah. something in that manner. You know, if you're going to stand up for the old boys club, stand up for the old <laughs> exactly. boys club. It's that tradition of, you know, the men going off for a brandy and a cigar. Yeah. You know, it's it's generally that turned into a, you know, restaurant or bar. Yes. It's, it's not a huge deal. It's not worth losing your job over. Also, now that everybody knows that the head of MI6 is a member, you know, who <laughs> else is a spy? I mean, you know, it's all the stuff. Let's talk about Banksy. Um, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the Banksy earlier this week that was uncovered in Islington of all places, uh, which was meant to be sort of sign signifying growth and yeah. the climate and all this stuff. Apparently it's been vandalised, which is the best news I've heard all week, really. Um, <laughs> but because I find... The... Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn, sorry, Jeremy Corbyn uh, walked past it and declared it to be a great thing. He and, was. Because uh, it was in his, his constituency, of course. Mm. Um, and the fact that... And I said it actually looks like somebody's thrown paint at the wall. Now somebody actually has thrown paint at it, and now it looks even worse. Sorry. Mm. Sorry. Um, yeah, I find the, um, the media sort of frenzy around Banksy quite amusing. Somebody's vandalised a Banksy. Well, graffiti started out as something that people called vandalism. Right. And I find it quite funny how Banksy's turned that on its head and it's become art yes. and it represents things. Whereas most um, graffiti artists will argue that that's what they are trying to right. do. Um, and I think it's very anti-Banksy that a lot of his, his works have been sold for millions. Yeah. You know, well, tried to yes. be preserved by accounts. But doesn't, doesn't, doesn't that show you more how sort of pretentious the whole art business is, though? Yeah. Because it's not... I don't think it's the media that's pushing it. It's the, it's the sort of art crowd who go, oh, isn't it amazing? He's, he's put something on a wall and now the building's worth more money than it was before. Well, yes, and I think he kind of reflects the politics of the art world as well, very perfectly. Yeah. I mean, when you think of artists sort of being, you know, he's meant to be an edgy artist, but he's not really, because who's he challenging? He's fully accepted by the art establishment. Mm. I mean, when you think of some of the artists that came through in like the 1920s and the 1960s, they were really challenging yeah. things. Well, when he was on, in one of his many stages of being uncovered, was it not revealed that he went to private school or something and he's not actually this kind of urban warrior that everybody thinks he is? Uh, and he grew up in a very nice sort of little part of the West Country somewhere uh, and had rather a nice set of parents and went to rather nice school. Well, one has to wonder how he feels about success because, of course, he was this sort of social justice warrior. He was anti-establishment. Right. He was anti-capitalism. Yeah. And now he's become a product of our capitalist society right. and our capitalist economy. Look at how much his works <laughs> this is will how sell culture, for. This is how culture works. I mean, the Mona Lisa was once revered and now it's sold on, you know, tea towels and T-shirts. It's how... You know, our consumerist culture works. Something that was once high becomes low culture. I think if I was an estate agent in London, I'd try and commission Banksy on the sly to uh, do one of his designs on a wall in my patch, and then that would drive up property prices. Yeah, well, the yeah, guy who owns that, that building said, well, I'm, good not, don't worry, I'm not going to... And that was the other funny thing, because apparently lots of people in that area live in quite... Um, poor accommodation, which is rented accommodation, social housing, etc. Um, but the guy that owns that building says there's three flats in it, um, and he'll and he'll now sell it. It was worth something yeah. like he bought it for something like seven hundred fifty thousand. He says I can now sell it for about one and a half million because it's got a Banksy on the side of it. But the price. So they could be evicted as a result of his social, you know, uh, cohesion. Policy. I just find the prices in the art world absolutely obscene. I remember watching um, a documentary years ago about the rise of the, the modern art movement and, like, ordinary people could afford to buy art and now it's just completely unattainable it's for elitic, most... Ord elitist. Yes, it's become like so banana. elitist. Do you remember how much the banana sold for with the duct tape? How much I, don't remember I, I think I think it was, um, it was definitely over a million. It was just a banana simply duct taped to a wall. Yes. And it became this huge, you know, yes. symbolic... Well, I've got piece. another piece I of art I can show you, and this is from uh, Waltham Forest, because uh, it's the first pictures of a sculpture of Harry Kane, uh, who is now, of course, <laughs> playing for Bayern Munich. It's one of those horrific sculptures of a footballer <laughs> that looks nothing like him. Um, apparently, um, it was completed in 2020 at a cost of £7,200, but has yet to appear in public. Probably, well, no wonder. Probably it's because it's, it's absolutely dreadful, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez, Awful. £7,000. I know. You struggle to spend £7,000. I mean, apparently, local Conservative councillors wanted to place a statue on Chingford's overground railway station, 
Um, <laughs> but after a risk assessment, this is great. This is typically British, isn't it? After a risk, risk assessment carried out by Transport for London, the proposal was denied on the grounds that it could be targeted by football fans who <laughs> don't like Harry Kane. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's, there's, uh, Public Heart hasn't been doing very well lately. I don't know if you saw the, the Mary Wollstonecraft sculpture. Yes. No. In yes. East London. <laughs> I mean, that was so controversial. I mean, they, they wanted to do something, you know, like to honour her as like right. a blue stocking. Yes. And, Anyway, I mean, this teeny little sculpture with, I think, like, very, you know, big appendages. You've got to be very careful with sculpture. Yes, I mean, yes. there's an awful lot of people who do it who don't seem to be very good at it. No, I mean, no. I think I can do a better sculpture than that. It's and pretty I hideous. Know what I'm doing. Some are good. There was the... Who's, who did the Remember one? the Ronaldo one that they did in Madeira? <gasps> oh, that was terrifying. The Madeira Airport, which looked absolutely <laughs> nothing like it. Look at Frankenstein. <laughs> it was horrific. <laughs> absolutely dreadful. Anyway, we've got lots more pic uh, pictures to look at, lots more stories to do. You're watching The Independent Republic uh, of Mike Graham. Next, we'll also have a look at tomorrow's papers off, off the press. And we'll be talking about gender madness in Whitehall. Don't go away. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oh, Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The World of Woke. The World of Woke has gone into overdrive today. We've got not one, but two stories of that world going particularly madder and madder. First up, it's a teacher who got the sack for refusing to use a student's preferred pronouns. He's up at a tribunal in Swindon claiming unfair dismissal on the grounds of victimisation of belief. Then there's the lawyer being sued by someone who works with the civil service just because she uttered the words 
only women can have periods. Obviously, an outrage in the world of woke. Let's start with Kevin Lister, a maths teacher at New College Swindon, who was dismissed for gross misconduct in September of 2022 because he refused to recognise a 17-year-old student who said she was socially transitioning and wanted to be referred to as he, him pronouns during A-level lessons. Mr Lister told the tribunal, I took issue with the demand on me to socially transition children who are unable to make an informed decision. That is the intention of the policy, to encourage children to socially transition and to push them towards transgender groups. Why are we not allowed to question why a student is presenting in the opposite sex? Seems a perfectly reasonable stance to me, doesn't it? Well, not for the wokest at New College. He added that it was his job to teach facts, not to allow girls to declare themselves boys. During one lesson, the student in question asked if she could enter a nationwide maths competition for girls. He replied, of course you can, because you are a girl. The barrister representing the college replied, do you accept that that was an insensitive response? I mean, for heaven's sake. Back in London, meanwhile, Elspeth Duma Wrigley is being sued for making gender-critical statements at work, including expressing the ridiculous belief that only women menstruate. The case is made all the more comical because it involves the civil service. Elspeth is a lawyer working with the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and she's also the chairwoman of a civil service network for people who agree with her gender-critical views. She's also been targeted after writing a letter expressing concern about what is going on in the department, to wit that imp impartiality is under attack from a small group of gender ideologues who brief against ministers and seek to alter official documents. Elspeth is accused of harassment for several comments and posts shared in the workplace, including a reference to a book for children called My Body Is Me, which encourages them to understand and accept their bodies. She's warning of a chilling effect that the case could have on shutting down debate and the right to a gender-critical point of view. The world of woke is indeed a very strange place indeed. The world of woke. Well, we're going to have a look at some stories from the papers, but what do you make of these two stories? I mean, incredible, really. The two things that concern me, one, socially transitioning. I assume that means transitioning just sort of on the face of it as opposed to taking any drugs or any kind of, you know, reassignment of your gender or any, or any actual surgery. And secondly, the thing that is being said about the civil service, that there are active sort of people working within it who are changing policy and are seeking to redraw, you know, bills and, and, and reword things. I mean, it seems extraordinary. I wonder, though, in light of the gender-critical activist um, Maya Forstatter, because she won a legal victory, yeah. saying that being gender-critical is a philosophical view. It is a right. Yes, still. yes, yeah. and she fought for that. So I wonder how that will be used in these cases, if it will be relevant I think it will those be relevant. Cases. But it's the fact that, that, that this lawyer is being criticised for having those beliefs and for trying to have those beliefs protected inside the civil service. And it seems like it's very difficult when you hold the majority, what most people would view... Yeah. Yeah. as common sense, rational opinion, mm. that it suddenly doesn't become a protected belief. It's only when you've got the fringe view yeah. or you're part of the ex sort of trans extreme militant lobby yes. that your, your views are, are sort of protected, at least uh, in law. But let's not forget, this is coming off the back of a victory for um, those who are gender critical mm. last week because the NHS announced that yes. it would not be prescribing puberty blockers to those who are under 18. Right. Um, and, and as well, it shouldn't be because we don't seem to fully know the impact of these drugs. We don't know what kind of uh, effect they could have on brain development. Mm. Uh, of course, there are concerns that some of the treatments are irreversible. They can have an impact on fertility. You know, yeah. are these really treatments that should be offered mm. to those to, to children, those yeah. who are under the age of 18? I think when it comes to the Kevin Lister story, which we were talking about, yeah. um, the, 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 the issue is that um, the school guidance that the government finally published in December does still leave a window open for children to socially transition right. uh, in, in schools, um, you know, in, in, and I don't know that it's necessarily clear for teachers, for head teachers, yeah. for those well, this working guy lost in schools. Well, this guy lost his job as a result. It shouldn't be something that goes to tribunal. It shouldn't be something that goes to a tribunal. And I, I support the right for people to transition, but I do not support the erasure of women. I mean, women have periods. This is a fact. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not going to stand there and say that, you know, as a female that I, you know, condone 
the fact that the word woman is becoming smaller in our social yeah. spaces and all of these fluid terms are becoming larger mm. than, you know, our right to exist. I, yes. I, don't, I don't think that's And okay. I think, unfortunately, because we don't see it every day in maybe in the workplaces where we are, we don't realise how bad it is. And I think in lots of educational establishments mm -hmm. and certainly in the public sector, there's this stuff is going on, you know, constantly all the time. Um, you know, and it seems to me that, that, you know, people should not be getting fired for having views which are clearly, you know, not just the norm, but, but are common sense re view, views based in reality. Well, this is, I mean, it's, it's a matter of debate. I yeah. mean, and it should be. And I think that this is... Just the influence. Well, it's not really. I mean, lots of it isn't a matter of debate. Well, it? It, well, it's, I mean, well, well I women agree. Women menstruate, men don't. That's well, not a debate. I agree, but I think that there are a lot of people who want to um, implement a lot of changes in our society based on their belief that gender is fluid, which I disagree with. And there are people who obviously question that and say, hang on yeah. a minute, no. But I think that the political activists have created a very toxic culture mm -hmm. where they want to shut yeah, down. Yeah, where they that's say you don't, you don't have dissent. the right thoughts. Well, look yeah. at Leo Varadkar. He resigned today, surprisingly. I don't think anyone was expecting it. But only last week, he had a referendum in Ireland in which he was asking to broaden the definition of family by removing a reference to marriage as a basis on which the family is founded. He wanted to replace it... Uh, on durable relationships as opposed to marriage. And then he said uh, he wanted to say that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. I mean, you know, he was trying to change the language by referendum. Bizarre. Yes, he was. He was trying to change the constitution um, and do it through a public vote rather right. than showing leadership. I think mean, this this announcement today is a bit of a bolt from the blue from the political establishment, but it is coming off the back of two yeah. crushing uh, defeats in those referendums, which were deeply embarrassing for Leo Varadkar and the brand of politics that he represents. And it does sort of feel as though um, the progressives across the West are starting to fall Fault, now. You yeah. know, you've, you, well, you've had no Jacinda Ardern Britain, in New Zealand, of course. We, yes, in yeah. Britain we had Nicola Sturgeon, yeah. Mark, uh, Mark Drakeford, yeah. uh, Justin Trudeau is going in Canada, mm. uh, Macron is on the ropes in France. So it does, it does appear that there's a trend now where politicians who are at seemingly out of touch with everybody apart from their own liberal metropolitan yeah. elite set are actually getting their they come They should up all just go and have and dinner together to and be done majority with it, instead of, of them. you know, bothering us. Eve, hey, let's finish up with, with a weird story. I understand you know a bit about this. The rise of reborn babies. Apparently, people are spending up to £20,000 on realistic dolls. What on earth is going on? I know somebody who spent far more on them and really? has her entire house filled with reborn dolls. Um, I've done a few um, pieces on this when I worked as a local reporter. Right. Um, it's not just for grieving or the loss of a baby or miscarriage. Is that what it was um, originally sort of designed? Yeah, that's the original intention and also to teach teenagers, you know, a, do you really want a baby? We'll look after this very right. realistic looking okay. one. But it's become a sort of subculture. You know, you can buy There's alternative reborns that are shaped like Oy. avatars. <laughs> Shrek babies, you know, and they feel, I've, I've held a few of these, they feel real, you know, they're weighted at the bottom. Right. And you can choose They don't wake you up every uh, couple of hours, though, I bet. Exactly, right? it's not that realistic. Uh, people think about a bond with them as well. <laughs> Women will say, I, bond, I bonded with this one, but I didn't bond with that one, you know. That's weird. That is very strange, isn't it? It'd be, it'd be interesting to know, though, to look at if there are chemical changes in the brain, whether they are actually bonding with it. I mean, if there is an emotional difference. It could be, but, I mean, you're about to be a mother for the third time, I think it is. Yes. Um, and I don't think there's any woman alive that would say there's, there's anything like that. You cannot replicate that feeling. You cannot replicate what it feels like to give birth, to be a mother, to breastfeed, all of those things. No. And I mean, I'm, I'm never going to know exactly what that's like, but just having children, you know. It's not a doll. No. I do wonder what the, who's the target market are. I mean, you, mm. obviously you talked about it being useful for teenagers and trying to presumably deter them from having children too young. Yeah. Although well, that seems think, like a very expensive way of doing this it. Is definitely not, um, this is definitely not the answer. Anyway, um, we've, we're all done for the night. That's all from me. You've been watching The Independent Republic and Mike Graham. Thank you to everybody for coming in. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow at 8pm. Good night. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treacle.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. A trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. 